I recently tried and made Detroit pizza for the first time in my life. It quickly became my favorite style of pizza. 154 square inches of chewy yet crispy caramelized cheesy goodness, all topped with a lovely tomato sauce. Tomato in America. If you haven't heard of it before, here's a quick primer. In the 1940s in Detroit, a gentleman named Gus Guerra who er started making pizzas in one of these. It's an actual motor pan that they used to use for oil changes, I think. And I'll leave a link in the description to get yourself one of these authentic seasoned Detroit pizza pans. But it's not just the pan and the shape of the pizza that sets the Detroit style apart from all the others. It's the type of cheese and how it's applied to the pizza that really sets it apart. A traditional Detroit pizza calls for a mixture of Wisconsin brick cheese and cheddar cheese liberally applied to the whole pizza so that it melts down the side of the pan and creates this lovely crispy cheesy crust. Have you ever made a grilled cheese where some of the cheese popped out of the sandwich and onto the pan and it got like all golden and crispy? Imagine that in every single bite. The major difficulty I found was finding Wisconsin brick cheese at any supermarket or local grocers. I had to go to a speciality cheese shop to buy it and it was very expensive and any options online were also. So I decided to embark on a little experiment with this particular pizza and I made it with 12 cheeses. I'm calling it D12 because D12 are from Detroit and this is a 12 cheese pizza. I mean 13 if you count the Parmesan, but that's like a baker's dirty dozen, isn't it? The whole aim of doing this was to find out what would be a good substitute for brick should you not be able to find it. And I think I got to the bottom of it and there was some really uh, surprising findings that you'll learn about as we get to that part of the video. This is Detroit style pizza, D12 edition. Will the real Detroit pizza please stand up? I want the food. They say that good things come to those who wait. It's not just a cliche. Wines that take longer to make, or beef that's aged and cheese that's aged usually have a more complex flavor. And the same can be said about pizza dough. This particular pizza dough takes three days to make, but that's mainly time and not three days of work. For this reason, I'm gonna split the video up into the three different days. Day one. This is the easiest day. All you're gonna do on day one is make the poolish. Poolish is a type of starter, otherwise called a pre-ferment, and it is going to give the dough a more complex flavor, a bit more nuance. All you're gonna do is mix the water with the yeast for 30 seconds, give it a vigorous whisking, and then add that to your flour, incorporate fully, cover with plastic wrap or a lid, and leave at room temperature for 18 hours minimum. Day two and your starter should have been sat at room temperature for 18 hours. Stick that in the fridge for another 30 minutes and then get on with making the actual dough. First thing to do is mix the dry ingredients together, flour, the malt, and whisk your active dry yeast into your tepid water. It should be 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Whisk for 30 seconds until you see bubbles forming on the top. If you see any granules that aren't dissolving, that probably means your yeast is dead. Now you're gonna add your iced tap water to the dry ingredients and incorporate fully. It'll be like a, a dryish feeling dough. We then add the sugar to the yeast mixture. The reason I add it in late and not in the beginning when I'm melting it is because I don't want the yeast to get too active. Remember, we're trying to take this easy, take it slow. Mix that yeast and sugar mix into your bowl and then add the poolish. Incorporate everything together and it'll start turning into like a sticky dough. Keep mixing, you'll see the technique I'm using here. And then we're gonna add our salt and olive oil and keep mixing it till it forms into a dough and starts coming away from the bowl. Then you wanna turn it out onto a floured surface and knead the dough for roughly five minutes. To knead dough, you just press down on it 
turn it 45 degrees, press the palm of your hand down in it again, and keep repeating that over and over again. You can switch hands if you'd like, and after about four or five minutes, you'll feel it getting sort of softer and more springy, more elastic. What we're doing when we're kneading dough is forming uh, glutens and uh, providing the dough with some elasticity. And the best method to find out if the dough is kneaded enough is to use what's called the window pane test. You cut off a piece of the dough and you pull it apart as far as it'll go before it breaks. And if before it breaks, you can see light through it, like a window pane, then the dough is immediately off. You will then put the dough covered in a bowl and let that dough rest at room temperature for 20 minutes. After which you will form it into a big dough ball technique is to push it all into itself and then you push the ball against the palm of your hand. Here's a quick demonstration. You push underneath it. For one of these 10 by 14 inch pans you want roughly 650 to 700 grams of dough. If you've got a little bit extra you can make dough like garlic knots or cinnamon bread thingies or just use that dough as a starter for another day. Once you've formed it into a ball you're gonna grease with butter and oil your pan, your chosen pan. Place the dough ball inside, cover it up, and rest it in the fridge for a minimum of 24 hours. Now it's day three. We take the dough ball in the pan out of the fridge and form it into its rectangle shape. Keep pushing it against the pan, to the edges of the pan, till it almost stays there. You don't want it to be exactly the shape of the pan because, of course, we want to promote cheese falling uh, around the corners and sides of the pizza. Try to keep it as level as you can so it doesn't slip around in the pan and rest at room temperature for roughly one to two hours depending on the temperature of your room or until it's risen by 1.5 to 2. In the time that the dough is resting in the pan you will want to preheat your oven to the maximum it will go. Ideally you want 500 degrees Fahrenheit and it you do want to preheat it for a good half an hour to an hour. If you've got a piece of steel or stone, that's a bonus because that's going to conduct heat and apply it to the bottom of the pan. After the hour or two is up and the oven's piping, piping hot, stick your pizza in there for about eight minutes. Whilst the pizza is in there for those eight minutes, you can really quickly make the sauce. You get all of the wet ingredients, blitz them together, add your dry oregano, and you're done. We're not cooking this sauce, by the way. All you're doing is bringing the sauce up to temperature. We're just gonna lightly warm it up right before the piece is ready. Remember that canned tomatoes are already cooked, so you don't wanna cook the living daylights out of them and have this sticky, reduced, thick mess. You just blitz the ingredients up, Stick it on a low heat till it's warm and wait till the next step. Try to resist opening the oven door during the first six to eight minutes, but after that time, you can have a little peek. You should see the pizza has risen by at least double and it will be all bubbly and there'll be some golden brown spots on it. Now it's time to apply the cheese. Of course, I went crazy with 12 different cheeses, but I'm gonna imagine that you've got two of them. You wanna put your more mild cheese all in the middle. So if you resort to Havarti, for instance, or Munster, provolone, mozzarella, something like that, like a milder cheese, put that in the middle of the pizza and then your stronger cheese, i.e sharp cheddar wants to be around the perimeter so that's the one that falls down and gets caramelized. Then you pop that back in the oven for another seven minutes at which point you'll see the cheese all bubbling all over it then turn it exactly 180 degrees and give it another eight minutes. You should get a really bubbly golden top and you'll know that it's done. <laughs> Then all you have to do is remove the pizza from the pan using a spatula or something thin and uh, sprinkle with parmesan cheese, cracked pepper, your sauce that has been warming and mange.
Look at it. F***ing perfection. What follows are my thoughts as I was trying the pizza, but after that, I'm gonna give you my final conclusion. Now that I've had more time to reflect on it, I've never anticipated eating a pizza this much. I'm salivating. Look at this. Look at this. Can you see it? Oh, that's, I can't tell if that's focus. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm gonna try the OG first. This is square one. Oh. Jesus. Oh my god. Look at that. Look at it. How does this stack up? This is the Havati Mots. She's good. The ultimate test is this crust. See the crust? Oh, look at the crust. Mmm. This is the Kobe Jack and Provolone. This one's got a bit more of a... like a bite to it. Not taste-wise, but texture-wise. Mm. Well, wow. that might be the closest. Tangy and nutty. This one was just nutty. Right, me. So this is the one I think came out the worst. Do you see how it didn't get any, like, my art? But who knows if that's gonna be good or bad. Mmm. You could easily get away with the Fontina Port Salute combo. Let's have a little look at the dough. Look at that dough. There's a the cheesy crust. Now it looks like it's not got any crust on it, but it's the same exact taste as the, the other one's just not as prominent. This one's the closest so far. This one's second, really is. Havati mozzarella. That's got every, that's got the pungent. P, it's got the N and the T. Got all three. But what I would do is, in the future, I'll put the pot salute in the middle and the fontina around the sides. So let's see how the fontina gets that Maillard. All right, I'm gonna get full. This is the Bella Swiss. This is the brownest one. Look at that. This is this got brown. Don't know if it was like necessarily the oven. Look at this. This is all cheese right here. Cheese. Beautiful. This one's the best looking. <clears throat> this is Bella Swiss. Very nutty. Mm. Swiss really transforms when you cook it. Look at the dough. Look at that dough. Look at that dough dough. Look at that dough dough. But no. This one's got, wow. That one actually like somehow brings the tomato sauce more forward. I don't know. It makes the tomato sauce more tomato saucy. Look at that now. I know I keep showing you, but Jesus. I think I should eat this bit right here. Should I eat this bit? Oh, should I? Mm. This one's very nutty. And it somehow enhances the tomato sauce. The last one is Jack Munster. This is a combo that I've read about on the internet. Here is the crust. There's the dough. Yes, look at that. Ooh, that one's close. Jack 
Master, it's very close. Might be in third place, might be in second place. The original, I hate to say this, but you need to go to a speciality cheese shop online and get some brick cheese. It's very distinct, but then again, this is the only one with extra sharp cheddar. So maybe in the next experiment, I'll try the extra sharp cheddar everywhere and the more softer, milkier, tangier ones with that. If you want to give me any suggestions on cheese in the future, let me know right down there. Let me know right down there. So basically regarding the actual texture of the pizza and the dough and all that stuff, this recipe is bang on. But regarding, regarding the cheese experiment, my overall epiphany was that it isn't even the brick cheese that matters. I tried each slice and each one of them that didn't have the cheddar on it was the one that was lacking that sharp, crispy, kind of sweetish, caramelized cheese goodness that I think typifies a Detroit pizza. Because everything I've read online about Wisconsin cheese and all of the substitutes that people suggest are all milder cheeses. And if that's the case, and it's not really a very prominent taste, then it's really the cheddar that is the most important cheese on the pizza. And I hate to say it, um, I think a lot of people might be saying that brick cheese is essential just because of its scarcity, um, but I beg to differ. I really, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I do. Uh, it's the cheddar, it's, it's all cheddar, baby. Um, so if you, if you get an, a nice mild uh, young cheese for the middle, and but make sure you've got a nice uh, sharp uh, white cheddar, or, or even just sharp cheddar for the perimeter, uh, you're gonna have a pretty killer Detroit pizza. Hope you make it and enjoy it. I'll see you next time.